All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. I have to preface this entire talk with the fact that I applied for this speaker position when I worked at a company called PeopleFluent, where we implemented all this magic and goodness. I now work at eBay. Um, so uh, without going into anything, uh, basically when I say we and when I say we did something, I'm talking about the previous job and I'm not talking about eBay. So my apologies in advance for both the fact that I have to clear up that confusion and for the fact that uh, I had to write this in two weeks when I learned that they were not going to release the IP permissions for me to show the old code in the old job. So um, I, you're seeing demo where and, and I, I had planned on showing the real thing, but oh well. Um, <coughs> all right, so I'll get started. Um, what I want to talk today about is how we can at least try to start the conversation about how to get developers involved in test automation. And I, I'm not talking about huge amounts, I'm talking about grabbing little tiny pockets of time so that they can help you in immense ways. And even if you don't get it, there's still quite a bit you can gain from this, I'm hoping, and we'll, we'll see. Uh, one of the problems that I see in test automation all over is the fact that PowerPoint doesn't work. Okay. Um, we're guided by failure. Does this sound familiar? We react. We spend our lives reacting to changes made or features added to a web app or something like that in, in such a way that we're guided by failures. We, we're, we're driven to look at the test failures from last night and there's 300 of them and, and who's going to be able to analyze them all? We're just sitting there waiting for the next shoe to drop, right? You sit there and there's a test fail and you just say, damn it, what, what did they do? Why didn't they tell me? Does that sound familiar? Because if it doesn't, then you know, your problems are solved and you might not want to be here. Um, we figured out that we had a team of seven people and 40% of our time was spent fixing broken tests. <coughs> and that's a lot. That was a lot for us, but that's because uh, the, the, the software architects did an amazing and brilliant job of building a web app that was extremely easy to work on. And so they could introduce features rapidly and they could change them at will and they could be certain that it all worked because they unit tested everything and they measured code coverage and they did all the right stuff that you hear that you should do in order to make a good web app. As a result, they didn't introduce fewer defects, they just made them easier to write, if that makes sense. So we spent a huge amount of our time fixing and reacting to their changes. And when I say changes, I'm talking about typical stuff. Uh, an HTML ID or a locator will change, something like that. An element type will change from a radio button to a to a drop-down list, or the major thing, which is that a uh, form will be split across two pages, they introduce some sort of user agreement pop-up in the middle in between them, that kind of a thing. And of course, what I don't have in here is what changes is a new flow is added. And each one of these things is going to break a test. So I'm sorry if it's a bit of an eye chart. I've got, what, what we did was a long time ago, we started building page objects. And I, I've seen a common theme in this, this uh, conference so far that people seem to be heading in the direction of building objects that contain all, all the information about one page that you'd want. And they'll declare their, their web elements within that page. And so the, all of the web elements will be tied together with a locator. So that's what we did. We implemented our own version of loosely wrapped web elements and we figured out how to construct them in a way that we would have the locator built into it. And so if the ID changes, the element doesn't exist, WebDriver chokes and throws an element not found exception. Uh, if the element type changes from a link to a button, um, sometimes WebDriver will be fine with it, a lot of times WebDriver will be fine with it. The better example would be the sel uh, drink single select uh, drop down web element to a radio button that would actually cause some real havoc. And uh, so, the, I mean, of course the big problem is pages are added, pages are introduced, that kind of thing. Uh, UI look and feel reset, they do that what, once a year? And um, at one point, my favorite example, and this speaks to, uh, if anyone was in Dan's presentation this morning, um, a, a real world example of, of the advantage of abstracting navigation away from your test cases is that we went from an all tab interface so that we had, it was an HR software, candidates, recruiting, uh, recruiters, that kind of thing. You'd have tabs across the top of the page that would change completely the content of the page. And one night they said to me, we're going to change that so that you have kind of this Windows Start menu at the top and instead of having a tab that's always there, you have to click the Start button and then you have to go down and, and the, the stuff from the tabs will be there uh, you know, in, a, in a JavaScript flyover. And the, the, the strength of what Dan's been proposing is that by abstracting the test layer away, we were able to 
implement the changes for that and have every test running and passing within about three days. So we had some goodness already, but it still wasn't quite enough, especially when the developer saw what we had to do. What happens is the developer makes a change and he checks it in. And you get your deployment, you get your, your, your thing, you, you execute your tests and they fail. And then you just, you just have a good cuss, right? You just, you just can't believe they, didn't, they did it again. They didn't send you an email, they didn't change. The requirements changed and nobody communicated it. Rerun the test several times, figure out exactly what happened, where in the stack did it happen. And then you have to go through and use Inspector or Firebug to figure out what is it? What, what do I have to do now? And you update your model page by page. So what we want is a mechanism for change communication. We want them to communicate their changes to us automatically. So you're thinking SVN spam, that kind of a thing. But there's a lot of SVN spam going around. We, have, we want to account for the changes as they happen. We don't want to just sit in reactive victim mode and feel our self-righteous anger whenever someone changes something and we have to go and give them a stern lecture. We, didn't, we just wanted to remove that from the equation. As a side effect, we wanted to get more tight integration with development. We had had an us versus them mentality and there was a wall between us. Does that sound familiar? Um, we were tired of it and we decided that if we could, we were going to build a solution that would make it to where we run all of their code on our environment, they run all of our code in their environment. That doesn't mean we execute their stuff and they execute our stuff. That means that it's in the same repository, it's using roughly the same language and the same objects, and it is talking to itself at compile time, and that's a key phrase. And of course, pass rate wants to be 97% or better. Um, that was, of course, a pipe dream, and we thought we would never achieve it. Uh, I don't want to, I'll skip to the end and say we, we sort of achieved it. So um, here's what our solution was. We wanted to generate the pages. And by that, I mean exactly what it sounds like. We wanted to get to a point where every time a change was made in the interface, we would get handed a new page object which represented the new state of that page. The web controls would be tight, uh, tightly mapped to web element types. And if it changes in a way that breaks an automation, the whole build will fail. That sound awesome? Who's with me? All right, so if the demo gods are smiling upon me, I'll show you the worst web page ever. <laughs> I am not a web designer. I, uh, I intentionally made this worse than I know how to make it because I don't want anyone coming to me and saying, hey, we want you to design our web page. Continuing with the theme of the worst web page ever, here's our method for creating a user. You fill out some fields, you submit, and you go to the landing page. Why the back button doesn't work, I don't know. I'm a terrible web designer. So let's look at the, uh, the code a little bit. Now, um, I keep referencing Dan's presentation this morning. We just, so like, if you were at Dan's presentation, just basically, we did that stuff he talked about. If you weren't at Dan's presentation, what we did was we made sure that tests are there to solve business problems. Tests are not there to do navigation. And that is always true. What we have is we have two things in the middle between a test and a page, and they're called the director or the fields object. The fields object captures data about a, kind, an, a, a certain kind of entity, like a user. A director performs actions upon that fields object, so that when I construct a fields object, I send, I send that fields object to the director, and the director knows what to do with it when I call create. So um, to put a finer point on it, this doesn't actually do anything in the browser. It merely sets data in a map. And then when I hand that to the director, it actually does stuff. So I'll go ahead and put a breakpoint here, and uh, everyone please say a pr silent prayer for me that it will actually do what it's supposed to do. This is just to show how this works right now. And it does take a while, so I could start singing Girl from Ipanema just like Simon did yesterday, or I can spare you. Were you all around for that yesterday? He had it in his, his head all morning, so he'd sit there singing Girl from Ipanema. <laughs> yeah. So it takes a while. I apologize. I don't have a solid state. All right, so as you can see, nothing has actually happened yet with the driver. I'm going to go into the create method, which illustrates sort of this point about abstraction. Inside the create method, you navigate to the page, you persist the fields, 
and the fields object knows how to do that. And then you click the submit button. So I apologize, I'm on 1024 by 768, so I'm having to do this. Navigate. I didn't hit it, did I? The demo gods are not smiling with me. So I'll just run it without a breakpoint. Oh, it did work. Yep, it did work, actually. So here, call fields.persist, and you'll see that it worked. And then we're going to hit the submit button, and we'll know what the, that we are there. So my question to you in showing you this is, what happens? I am now going to stop this test, and I'm going to put on my developer hat, and I'm going to go into create user.vm, and I'm going to say that um, we're moving the email field to a different page, or actually, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit more benign example. We are going to start supporting China. And in China, as far as my understanding is concerned, you don't have a first name, or the first name is the last name. We don't want to, we don't want to build a notion of sequencing in anymore. We want to abstract that away. We, we want to call it a given name because that's, that's we, we want to be a little bit more sensitive culturally. And so the developer thinks, I'm going to change the label. And while I'm at it, I'm going to change the ID because I'm clever. So me, as a tester, I'm going to run this test now. And once again, demo gods being invoked, we will see that it should fail. See, it missed that. So this is a little bit of an artificial example, but do you see where I'm headed? This kind of thing happens a lot, doesn't it? Something in the neighborhood. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invoke, uh, pretend, pretend that this is an ant target. This is how testers write, ant, uh, write little demo things. They put them in tests, right? So I'm going to now run the magic, which is the thing that actually runs around and updates all of my pages. If you want an analogy to this, the eBay legal folks made me take it out of my presentation, but um, think about Google Maps where they're doing road construction all over the place and you notice that your house is brand new but it's not on there yet because they haven't run that car around for the last six months. That's what you're all working on. You know, yeah, so generate pages. That's what we're doing in, in most of test automation is that car gets driven around when things break. And what I'm proposing here is a system where the car gets driven around whenever the developer changes something. Let's see, refresh. So now let's look at my page declaration. I'm afraid the demo gods are not smiling upon me. It still says first name. Oh wait, no it doesn't. It updated the ID. So basically what I've done is, as a tester, I've gone through and I figured out how to run the car around and I've seen that there's a change to this. And now when I run my test users, my everlasting hope is that it passes. And I got a much better example coming, so. I don't know if you saw that, but it worked. <laughs> it actually was able to fill out the field and everything. I could set a break point, but I'd rather go to a little bit more interesting example of, you remember how this guest login is a link? Let's change this to a button. I'm once again, I'm a developer, and I'm changing this to a button because look and feel is kind of weird. You have this cancel, you have this other thing. And so I'm gonna change that to a button. Notice in the base create user page, this is a button web element. Notice further that in my fields object, we have things that roughly mirror inside the, that data map I was talking about. They roughly mirror the things that are in the page object. And by the way, in real life, this would be generated too. But 
for the, for the demo code, I didn't quite get there. But the, the real point is that as far as the tester is concerned, it's not a button, it's an iClickable. We code everything to interfaces. So in the example specifically of a drop-down list changing to a radio button, if you think about the root behavior of that, or a better example is uh, we designed a custom web element that would, in our case, bring up, you push a button, and it brings up a grid, a table full of stuff, and you select one element from that table, and you say OK, and it populates a single field with a single value. As far as we are concerned, as far as our web elements are concerned, those are all three the same thing. It's called an iSingle select. So if the developer goes and changes what they do, when we run our code generation again, it's still an iClickable as far as the tests are concerned, and everything still works. So let me run my page generation. Told them to get me an SSD. They didn't do it. I told them I was going to stand up here and look like a fool, waiting for Eclipse to refresh itself. This is where Simon would say, if you used a real IDE, you know. <laughs> so, so let me refresh. This is the thing I was always forgetting in the previous demos is uh, to refresh the workspace. You'll notice the guest login is now a uh oh. Guest login is now a button web element, not a link web element. And once again, test users is passing, and it's going to work fine because this is an I clickable when it gets clicked. So um, the last example, and I think the one that's kind of where the magic really happens is. I'm going to put my developer hat on again, and I'm going to create a new flow. Hmm. Any Mac people know why I can't focus, uh, can't copy this file? There we go. Developer once again, and I am cleverly going to go in and create a brand new flow. And if I go to the site, I'll see that it's already there. Big long form, create a new patent. And as a test automation person, what's my job? I have to go now and use Firebug and select all that stuff. But with one little thing that in the demo where would actually is, is actually kind of a pain. I have to add this to the list of files that are being parsed. But assuming that you have a library that's smart enough to know how to get those things, all you have to do is rerun your page generation. Once again. Refresh, base add patent page, and it's there, like magic. So um, I'm not going to bore you with actually constructing the test, because I, build, I would now build something called a patent director, and the patent fields object would be handed to me, and then I would construct the create, read, update, navigate, exists methods for, those, for that patent object, and then I could start writing tests. So if you add that page at 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm writing tests against it by 11 o'clock. And the, the point is, this is one page. But if it was 15 pages, it would be exactly the same. If it was 100 pages. If you have only automated against 300 of 800 pages inside your model, once you get this working, you now have the ability to model all of it. So um, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of self-evident why, why it's so cool to me. But the, the good news is, it's not just something that we did at this company that was so amazing. What we did was we generated Sorry, we wrote a parse factory method that would take a file like a VM or something like that, and it would say, oh, that's a velocity file. I know how to parse that. And it would hand you back a page based on that velocity file. We also wrote a JSP parse against a, we merged with the company, and they said, well, yeah, but you'll never be able to get that from our stuff because our UI is inconsistent and all that stuff, and we're not going to work with you like those other guys did. Well, we had a pretty smart guy on my team who went and he just did it. He just, 
He wrote a JSP thing, look, use a SAX parser to go in and say, what's the type of this element? What's the ID? What's the locator? And it would build the page object just the same. The, the point is that we code everything to interface, and when you're done, as long as it looks like this using the same meta, metadata, then everything else just works. So let me go back to play. So that's it. You get a page containing every element. <coughs> Furthermore, the, one of the magic things that we built into it was we, had a, we did still have remnants of a tabbed interface so that certain elements would only appear if you had selected a tab first. Does that come up much? So you have four tabs on a page, some buttons, a web driver won't let you click it if it's not displayed. So as part of the generation, we would actually tell the elements what their associated tabs were so that when an element said, I need to be clicked now, or set, they would auto-select the tab that they were associated with and they would populate themselves. And that happened every time you were to set a web element. It would check for its tab and it would automatically set it. We were talking a little bit earlier about these rich composite web elements that we would build. And in our case, we had a lot of dealings with tables and these tables had strongly typed columns. And we thought, well, all integer columns work the same way. What, what if we generated an object called a grid object that would have a notion of what columns are in it already and what type of column each one of those is? And then we can iterate over the pages that have grids and we can start to, to have them test themselves in kind of a smart reflection-y kind of way. So here's the new cycle. I think something I haven't quite focused in enough is the fact that this isn't on you. It probably is, but <laughs> in our case it wasn't, and hopefully one day we can get this culturally ingrained that when a developer changes something on his desktop, he, as a part of, a part of running his build before he checks in, as part of running his unit tests, he regenerates the entire test automation model. And if he has generated something that is going to cause a compile time failure with anything in the test automation framework, it breaks his build and he has to address that before he checks it in. So that's the kind of magic that we had that I, I'm, I'm certain, I don't think we're going to get that at eBay, but in, in any case, if we can get some of this, we're still better off than we were before because we'll know at compile time, we generate the model however that happens, and we'll know before we run a single test whether or not we're going to have changes, whether or not they broke test automation. So developer, in, in our particular case, the developer changes the page, he runs the, the generation. He doesn't actually run our tests. He runs the, the regeneration of the page objects, and then he compiles it against our automated tests, and it's all part of Ant. If it fails, he has to address it. Usually that's on the phone of, hey, hey, Marcus, uh, I did this thing, and now automation's telling me it's wrong, and we have a five-minute conversation, and it's over. We've moved to his desktop instead of moving all the way to continuous integration, moving all the way to full staging deployment, moving all the way to a week and a half later when you are running your tests and you're seeing failures and you're getting annoyed. Now we're having the conversation 10 minutes before he makes a check-in. When he checks it in, I update my source and I regenerate the model on my own desktop. I execute my tests. If they fail, in general, there's a couple kinds of failures. If he's changed an ID or he's changed a locator, I don't even notice it. It's only ever declared in that one place in that page object de declaration. And if he's changed the way you locate that, it automatically gets regenerated, so I don't even notice. If he changes the type in a way that it, that it broke at compile time, he already fixed it. If it changes in a way that it breaks navigation flow, there's nothing I can do about that. I'm going to have to re-update. But what I don't have to do is use Firebug and figure out in what way did it change. I just have to sort of reread, re-explore, and tell my, my middle layer, my abstraction navigation layer, how to account for these changes. And then it's mere work. So we went from a quick test professional project in 2008, where we had in three years built around 700 really, really good, really well designed for quick test professional test cases. Um, they passed at a rate of about 75%, and if we got higher than that, we just about threw a party. When we got started with WebDriver, it was about two weeks after Simon gave his GTAC talk in New York City, which was, I don't remember what year. Um, 
the guy I stole that joke from earlier, he modeled a page object using WebDriver, and one of our software architects stood behind him, and, and he said, he just sort of looked at it and looked at it and looked at it, and he said, we could give this to you. So getting that kind of involvement with the architect level, I'm not going to say, you know, you have to do it, but if you do get it, if you even get a little piece of it, they planned to go dark for a month to help us with this project. They got about a week and a half, and they got pulled back into the real stuff. And that week and a half laid the foundation for it, and it really wasn't really that much. We, have, we spent barely any time at all maintaining this model after it was built. It, it, it simply worked, and when it did break, we could fix it, we in the test site. So mainly the ask from development was up front. It was give us a few weeks of your time to explain the presentation layer and help us construct stuff but mostly, we weren't Java developers. We were VB script developers. So most of it was teaching us how to use generics and, and interfaces. So if you already know that stuff, you're not going to have to have uh, four days' worth of conversation with them where they're teaching you Java 101. They just get to work. And so, um, th yeah, that, that's, the, <laughs> that's the point. The, so in three years after implementing this solution, we had... Instead of seven people, we had gone down to three because of tough times. And we had 1,900 test cases. And they were passing at a rate of 98% <coughs> because the maintenance disappeared. It, I can say, I can make the statement conclusively that at that job, it went down to effectively zero. We didn't even measure it. So whether or not that's going to happen at eBay, no, I, I have no idea. But I guess what I'd say is, even if we get a small piece of this, we'll be no worse off than we were before. And we'll know where we stand on any given day with, with all of it. So the next thing I think is uh, sort of general, it started to occur to me that you don't need this in order to do some pretty special magic on your own. Um, Dan talked about using reflection this morning uh, to, to have pages do a self-test. I couldn't recommend that more. I think that even if you have a page object model that you're maintaining by hand right now, it's a very interesting thing to do. You can say, go to each page and perform some operation as a kind of self-test. And if the code maintains itself from, direct, from developer change like ours did, you have a much more interesting conversation because you're, never, you're, you're generally not dealing with false positives. If something goes wrong, you know, it's either been addressed already or you're going to find some new problem and you can be pretty certain it's not because there's an element that's missing or the page has changed because that's already been accounted for. We used to measure ourselves in the number of regressions we found in automation. And it, uh, as you can see from these numbers, it went up at a pretty steady clip. We found 50 in 2011, just because of the sheer numbers, because each of us had such amazing velocity. We had such amazing velocity that we were not only able to add huge numbers of tests at a time, but we were able to solve some of the other really big fundamental problems with test automation. For instance, sleep statements. There wasn't a single one anywhere in our tests, because we had time to address it not fixing our code. So the really interesting thing was, at no point did the rate of defect discovery go down. And that's because we were helping development work so much more efficiently and so much more, I guess, proactively. <coughs> they were able to introduce features at a rate I've never seen. So they were able to break and break and break their stuff in a way that, I mean, it, it was all breaking it, broken at, the, at the, the business logic layer, usually not at the UI layer. They would introduce something as a result of a bad requirement or something like that, and they would introduce these defects, but the system just worked together a lot better. So that's essentially all I've got. I, I don't have any more. I could probably show a little bit more code, but uh, <laughs> demo where. <laughs> so if there's any questions, I know that a lot of this is a little bit vague and hand-wavy and magical, but it works, so <laughs> yeah. Right, this, this has the, 
the possibility of masking some of those kinds of issues. So you can sort of paper over a problem that was introduced that was bad. I, I, guess, I guess my statement is you, you're no worse off than you were before. You, I mean, so that's forcing you to recognize that, that, that the change was there and that maybe the change is good. But my bet is 90% of the time, it's not. And so we'll take that. We'll take that risk, slight risk of that. And um, yeah, uh, that's, that's the way I would, I would say it. Um, um, the thing I wanted to ask you is that it looks to me that you know, sometimes, or most of the times, you know, working projects, that they don't have like, a very good framework in order to, you know, to, to define pages or something like that. Right. And, and sometimes the, kind of, the number of changes that could happen, you know, that's so big. In that kind of situation, do you think it would be worth doing something like this? Because imagine, it's not just about changing the idea or things like that, but uh, you know, here you are a bit safe you know, by the fact that you have just an XML file or something to define pages and they are all really similar to each other. But when it comes to you know, people writing directly HTML or something like that, do you think the effort maybe introducing in writing something like this could not pay off maybe? Or do you I, I certainly think it's possible that it would not pay off. It, it's, it's all about, I mean, sort of the, the typical question of automation is how difficult is it to automate mm -hmm. and how important is it to the customer? And in this case, the automation I'm talking about is the parser and the customer is you. So how much of your time is spent accounting for, if you don't change your page model as it is when these things happen, if you're not affected by it or you just sort of assume that you're not gonna get it right, then yeah, but this, this might not be the solution. Uh, but you know, for, for, for cases where the change is fairly consistent across the broad application, this can really be helpful. So it's, it's certainly not a solution for everything, but it's, it's, no, it's absolutely. I mean, yeah. sometimes I have to spend a long time, you know, like yeah. changing small things uh, in those yeah. kind of situations really helpful. And don't get me wrong, I really like that. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not a solution for everything, but if, if you can, for us, the stars aligned and we were able to do some stuff that was just unbelievable. I don't expect ever to work in an environment that good again. I, I don't know. But the camera is watching me, so eBay's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> IDs aren't it, consistency is it. And, and, and I know that that's another thing that every, every team is gonna struggle with. The, we, we, once again, stars aligned, we had some amazing people. Uh, they had unit tests that would enforce the consistency of how they constructed their velocity macros. And if they constructed them wrong, it wouldn't even get to us before it said, you did this wrong. So that's not, that, I, I would say it's not realistic except we did it, but it's not realistic to expect that. So your parser has to be kind of smart, kind of interesting, and you're not going to get everything you want. What I would probably start with as a hello world is just give me all the buttons. I, I don't, just give me all the buttons, see if you can find a way to locate, that kind of a thing. And the way I wrote it, uh, by the way, um, this is all on GitHub and at a, a project called Tasty Monster. <laughs> don't ask me, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's all on, it's all there. I, I'm, I didn't want to refactor it the way I want to because I didn't want to break my demo, but there's a lot, a lot about the directory structure that's wonky, so I apologize in advance. It's demoware. But you'll see in there that there's something called the parser factory, and then there's the, I don't even probably show the class. It's, um, page generator is where, this is, this is where the, the actual model is built, and you can see it's, I try to do a decent job of commenting <laughs> and uh, making the methods fairly short. Um, so I have these things called parse free marker, parse JSF, parse velocity. They're not there, but they are meant to sort of give you the idea that they could be there. <laughs> so parse velocity, all it does is it maps a macro in the presentation layer, gets mapped in a rather brute force way to a text box. Form password is another text box. Form button is a button. We ignore certain macros and then we build a set of field details with everything that we find in there. And I know one thing that's come up a lot when I've talked about this is that there's a lot of Ajaxy stuff that will cause an element to appear or disappear from a page. And that's another example where I think it's great that we're looking at this from the developer's point of view at compile time. Because if there's something like in Velocity, you'd have a pound if 
and you would render a different button based on the conditions inside that pound if, but this parser ignores pound if, and it renders every button. So your page object is going to have every button permutation in there, and it's your job as the tester to figure out which one you're trying to invoke at a particular time. That's a little bit oversimplified, but that is, that's how we solved the problem. We didn't try to smartly determine which button should be existing in a certain case. We, we just put them all there. Another thing that we did was um, we have this thing called the ad base ad patent page, but at the same time, we have this thing called the ad patent page. Let me go to one that I know exists because that one I just create. Um, create user page dot Java. If you will see, the base create user page is the one that's generated. Then we have this thing called the derived user page, create user page. And it extends the base user. So it has all the characteristics, but this is where you put exceptions. If your parser isn't working for some reason or on a particular web element, or you have one web element that was created in one place in one way, and it's not a pattern, you can put all the exceptions here. And you can have this page behave in a slightly different way by overriding the derived class. And we check this into the repository. We don't check the base page in because it gets regenerated on the continuous integration server. I'm sorry, I just started talking again. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. If you find a way to re um, reverse engineer and find elements using XPath or CSS in the parser, or was it just on the name and IDs? It was all on the IDs. We were fortunate enough that um, this project got started in 2005, like the month I got started. And I said, please put an ID on everything. <laughs> and just by saying that when I said it, we didn't have to worry about XPath. So once again, not realistic, but it worked. <laughs> yeah. So you put IDs in uh, no, we didn't put IDs on grids. We handled that a little bit differently using some magic. I don't even remember. I didn't write that part. But, um, yeah. Any, I saw one over somewhere. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah. Can you name some drawbacks of the system? Uh, drawbacks of the system. The, so, as implemented, I... I don't, I, I worked with it for three years and I, st I was still discovering new things to do with it. Drawbacks for implementing this at a place like eBay or any other company are you have, to, you have to build this relationship or you have to come to understand their presentation layer. You have to build trust with them so that they will actually let you look at their source code, which was not a conversation that ever even came up at this company. So the drawbacks are, I would say, cultural, political, getting people to buy into how great it is. Because... In bugs, for example. Sorry? In catch in bugs. In catching, bugs. right, but I mean, our, our opinion was regression tests are not meant to find, regression tests are meant to pound on stuff that the human beings should not have any business pounding on. Uh, so we caught some bugs with it, but, the, you know, when you're running a regression suite, you're not trying to make it be a human. You're trying to make it do stuff that the human is going to, his eyes are going to glaze over and his eyes are going to cross and he's going to sit there and by, you know, by the fourth hour of it, he's going to be in such drudgery, but the computer is going to spot changes in flow and changes and stuff like that. But we did find a few regressions. We found quite a few. Um, there, but the drawbacks, in my opinion, are in the upfront cost in creating it. Especially if you don't know going in, you're going to be able to get much out of it. If your presentation layer is a bunch of crap and you, you, don't, you can't believe the people who wrote it got away with writing it the way they did and it's completely inconsistent, maybe this isn't the way to go. <laughs> but my hope is that there is some element and some piece you can find. If you have page elements now, a lot of people have page objects right now. And what I'm trying to do at eBay is we have page objects and they are hand maintained. And I'm trying to say, okay, I'm going to derive now every one of these page objects from a base class that's, that's not generated, but that at some point we hope will be generated. And I'm going to start populating this little by little with the elements that I can get out of the presentation layer and I'm going to insert that layer in, and you guys aren't even going to notice it's there. And in fact, we've started the toy with the idea of, instead of having these element declarations be in a base class, we're talking about having, having them in an interface, so that you can say that this page has these elements and has some sections from these elements. So if you have a, a, some sort of div that has a form, and that form appears on several different pages, you could just implement the interface and say, that's, that's always there, that kind of a thing. Something we're toying with, so I, I haven't quite got that down yet. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, yeah, like the drawbacks are, I'd say, mostly in getting it. So fair upfront cost, probably not as much as you think, and you're probably not going to get the magic we got, but hey, man, you'll be a lot better off than you are, even if you get a little bit of it. So um, this, is, this is my sort of advocacy for, for 
letting developers know that we are serious. We are serious people who know a serious lot about Java. And we're using typing in a way we're, that we're embracing it, we're not running from it, and we're letting it help us, not trying to dodge it. And this is sort of the way I try to convince developers that they should let me look at their code because my, my bet is I could find a lot of bugs and help them a lot. So see if you can do likewise. <laughs> All right, anything else? Well, anyway, I'll be around, so. Certainly. <laughs> yep.